This is the book The Wolf Time, a Black Library novel for Warhammer 40,000. It is book three in the Dawn of Fire series, the series which aims to articulate the current events of the setting. This is essentially the post-Great Rift events, which so far is, for the most part, from the Imperium's point of view, focusing on the campaigns of the Indominus Crusade and Rebute Gilliman's efforts as Lord Commander. And while reading through the Wolf Time, I found certain elements to be strange. And the more I thought about it, the stranger it seemed to be. And so after finishing the book, I figured I would make a video on why exactly the Wolf Time is cringe time. Background So if you couldn't tell by the title or the art, the Wolf Time is a novel which focuses on the Space Wolves. For some, this is already a mixed bag. You see, of the nine first founding chapters, the Space Wolves are one of the three which have been favored by the IP, having received a disproportionate amount of model kits and novels compared to the rest. This would normally be a boon, and I suppose it technically still is. But it seems the Games Workshop of Editions Past saw fit to brand the Space Wolves in such a way to maximize appeal to consumers between the ages of four to six resulting in a range that feels like they tried to prefix everything they could using the word wolf. And where they couldn't, they used some wolf-related term like fang. This created a special snowflake kind of effect, since every other chapter uses the same name for all of the units they share. In fact, the absurdity became so severe that it almost seems possible that the Black Library authors had to write in lore that the Space Wolves don't even call themselves Space Wolves and look at the name as a detestable term used by outsiders. Though lampshading the issue doesn't really solve anything. All of that contributes to the memory which surrounds the Space Wolves presently. With the baggage accounted for, choosing the Space Wolves as the point of focus for any story is, to a degree, an uphill battle, and probably should be handled rather delicately to reframe the reputation and any negative associations which have been accrued up to now. And so, I went into Gav's depiction of the wolves looking to be impressed. But unfortunately, regrettably, tragically, what we have is a story which furthers the Space Wolves' negative qualities to service weak plot points and ham-fisted payoffs, which only exacerbates the Space Wolves' negative qualities and reputation and general disposition. It's a mess. And so, what I plan to do in this video is to dive into the story take a look at the actions characters make and why they make them, so you can see the cringe for yourself. But first, a bit of context. Like with many stories, there are multiple plots running across multiple point-of-view characters. I'll only be going over those necessary so as to not muddy the waters. Our POV characters include Logan Grimnar, Krom Dragongaze, Uller, and Gaius. This list falls into a hierarchy of rank. The first two are already established characters, complete with their own unique models on the tabletop. Logan Grimnar is the chapter master of the Space Wolves. Krom is a captain of one of the Space Wolves' battle companies. Uller is a squad leader within Krom's company. And Gaius is a Primaris Marine, fighting as part of the Indomitus Crusade. It is he we will be starting with. When we meet Gaius, he is part of the Unnumbered Sons within the Indomitus Crusade, and we learn he is of Lehman Russ's gene seed. That is the same genetic lineage as the Space Wolves for those unfamiliar. Gaius is, as far as we can tell, a stand-up dude. His most notable quality is that he's very pro-Space Wolves and their culture. He longs to be a Space Wolf. He even has a little guidebook given to him from a Historator, where he reads up on Fenrisian terms and learns what cultural norms he can. After a few chapters wrapping up their current mission, Gaius learns that he and the other members of his unit, all of which are of Space Wolves' gene seed, are to go to Fenris and join the Space Wolves proper. Their task is to bring word of the Indominus Crusade and to notify the Space Wolves of a Torchbearer fleet's arrival, which will provide the Space Wolves with Primaris reinforcements and tech. That is the tech to create Space Marines like Gaius, which is essentially an improved Super Soldier template compared to the existing type. For Gaius and his crew, who are all like-minded when it comes to Fenris and the Space Wolves, it's a dream come true. A few beats later, we pick up mid-mission with Uller and his unit of Bloodclaws, engaged in combat with Orcs. The battle is dire, but as luck would have it, Gaius' route to Fenris crosses paths with this battle. And with support from Gaius' group, they turn the battle around. 
Despite the clear cultural divide, Gaius' batch of Primaris Marines are welcomed into Krom Dragon Gaze's company. Krom is eager to bring the news of Gaius' mission, as he's quite competitive with the other company captains. And so Krom's company make plans to return to the Space Wolves' base on Fenris. In the chapters which follow, we see Uller help Gaius' group acclimate to the Fenrisian culture. Keep this in mind for later. Meanwhile, running parallel is a mission Logan Grimnar and company are undertaking within a space hulk riddled with orcs. It results in them being overwhelmed and they decide to retreat back to Fenris. This is in part due to a vision perceived by Njal the Stormcaller, which leads them to believe Lehman Russ, their Primarch, has returned. So they retreat from the Space Hulk, but they vow to return. Now with the context clarified, let us proceed. Disposition Over the course of events which make up the Wolf Time, many of the key players of the Space Wolves have a terrible showing. Most notably, Logan Grimnar. The laundry list of instances where they are petty, display weak argumentation, and act irrationally is long. This choice to repeatedly portray the stars of the show so poorly at every turn is odd to say the least. Let's blitz through a few examples. The setup here is Logan Grimnar and Krom Dragon Gaze have both returned to the Et, the Space Wolves base. And currently, Krom has been summoned by Logan Grimnar for a scolding, while the Primaris Torchbearer fleet has arrived in the Fenris system and has been threatened to come no closer. Naturally, Krom explains that after fighting for years, he comes home bearing good news, new allies and reborn warriors, and yet he is treated poorly. To this, Ulrich expresses his disapproval, and explains that Krom's bringing strangers to their base. Krom then explains they aren't strangers, they fought alongside his company, have had members who have fallen in battle, and are now sworn to his company to fight for Logan Grimnar. And to this, Ulrich, in his great wisdom, says, So did the dragon spears, said Ulrich, every word laden with disdain. Are they to be warriors of the Wolf King too? This is an embarrassing rebuke on Ulrich's part. Not only is this an obscenely bad faith retort, but it doesn't account for the fact that Gaius' men are of Lehman Russ's gene seed, granting them far more justification to join Krom's company. This is a fact none of the characters bring up, because before Krom can defend himself, Logan Grimnar has an outburst. They saved your ass! You nearly shamed us in front of the Dragon Spears, and now you bring these Imperial Deceivers to Fenris! There isn't a lot to say here. The Space Wolves are characterized as being prideful to a fault. This is that fault. Logan Grimner cannot rationalize that if you continually go fighting with depleted numbers, it's quite likely you will eventually either die or be saved by another force. Grimnar is unable to see the honor in fighting well enough to hold the line so that allies can do their part and victory can be attained. Krom then earnestly asks if Logan is questioning his command and his loyalty, and Grimnar essentially just calls him an idiot and doesn't answer the question, and instead insinuates that Krom is leaving an opening for Gilliman and his lackeys. Now, while it would be ideal for a leader to acknowledge and respond to the questions of those under his command, who also share their own burden of command, Logan does have a valid if somewhat misguided point. Krom bringing in Primaris Marines does leave room for the Torchbearer fleet to interact with them, but is Logan so dumb that he honestly thinks that if Krom didn't bring them in, the problem as he perceives it would cease to exist? Because he's sure acting that way. Logan continues on to reprimand Krom, pointing out that he spoke of their weaknesses to, as he puts it, Ultramarines in Wolves clothing. Krom points out that Logan doesn't have the authority to forbid Gaius' men, who are sworn to his company, from staying in the Et. And then Logan Grimnar responds with, Perhaps you are right. I do not have that power. But the heavens above it are mine. Their ship will come no closer. By my command, as is my right, and so I declare now, no vessel of Fenris will approach within 10,000 miles of the Imperial ship, unless to board it for battle. Your new brothers can join you as soon as they learn how to swim the void. A good look for the Commander-in-Chief. Instead of trying to find reason or come to any sort of understanding, Grimnar pretty much says, Fine, but I can prevent you from getting your way, so there. And Krom, realizing he's dealing with a child, shows some poise and delivers a slam dunk of a valid argument before leaving. 
So be it. You are my king, my commander, my axe brother, and I will die for you and the Et. But not when 10,000 and more ready warriors are to be cast aside. Overall, Krom's actions and general disposition come off valid and reasonable in this scene, while Logan, Grimnar, and Ulrich are levying bad faith retorts with weak argumentation. It's just not a good look for your chapter master to be making outbursts and claiming that Gaius' group are ultramarines in wolves' clothing, something we the audience know to be false. But more on that later. Surely, any leader in Grimnar's position would want to meet these newcomers for themselves, to better temper their own judgment. But spoilers, Logan Grimnar doesn't. Why doesn't he? Well, we're not given any rationale from Logan, and nobody brings up the idea either. Though I will point out that 80 or so pages later, Grimnar does attempt to visit the Primaris Marines in Krom's Hall. But wouldn't you know it, as luck would have it, they get pulled away for a mission. After Krom leaves, the chapter concludes with the Space Wolves' High Command reflecting on their dire state, having suffered losses not seen for thousands of years, and Logan comes to a conclusion. Killerman has been brought back from the lip of the Abyss. The Wolf King will surely follow out of the darkness if we guide his way. We gather as a chapter to attack Gotrok. This is the wolf time, the final battle for the wolves of Fenris. The dots Grimnar is connecting here oozes with desperation. For context, each Space Marine Legion had a super dad called a Primarch, which has either been slain or lost to time. Gilliman is the only super dad to have returned. Lehman Russ, the Space Wolves Primarch, left a prophecy that he will return from beyond when his chapter is on the brink of death, for the final battle, for the wolf time. The desperation is undeniable. Logan Grimnar, in his infinite wisdom, is hoping to send the Space Wolves to their destruction, in order to summon their super dad from the twisting infinite existential dimension that is the warp. The logic is borked. And it's not even for a big bad legendary named character in the setting, like Abaddon, Magnus, or Gazgul. It's an unnamed orc psyker warboss which holds dominion over a space hulk. He is willing to do this instead of accepting Primaris reinforcements from Gilliman because bringing the space wolves to healthy numbers actively moves away from his delusional worldview. Following the previous event, 20 odd pages later, an ultramarine's lieutenant meets with Logan and his council to essentially make a case for the space wolves assisting in the Indominus Crusade and accepting the Primaris reinforcements. Once Castellor arrives, Logan begins questioning the rank of Lieutenant. Castellor responds, There have been a lot of changes, Lord Grimnar. Many overseen by the same mind that wrote the Codex Astartes when that rank was retired. This stirs something in Ulrich. You're a good one. I can see why they chose you. Just slipped it in there. A reminder that your Primarch is back from the dead. Ulrich, Ulrich, Ulrich. This isn't the kind of behavior one expects from the spiritual leader of a Space Marine chapter. I mean, given the question which preceded Castellar's answer, the referencing of Gilliman was quite clearly made to imply that the changes Grimnar's questioning is coming from an authority which has the right to overrule the established rules, and not a brag of his Primarch returning. Though it does serve as a good self-report for your insecurities. The next exchange goes as follows. Castellor delivers his message. Your chapter's participation would be an enormous boon to the Indomitus Crusade, Lord Grimnar. Flattery? Is that all you bring to us? He can carry on if he wants. For a minute or two. You are head of the Apothecarian, Lord Ulrich. Have you studied the Primaris data I dispatched? I looked at it, replied the Slayer. Again, not a good look for the Fenrisians here. Castellor, only communicating his request, while giving a chapter master of a first founding chapter the respect he is due, is treated coldly. And what does Castellor do? This Chad calmly points out that he has provided ahead of time what Ariak insinuates he is lacking. Ulrich goes on to say he has reviewed the data. And Grimnar asks how many Primaris Marines does Gilliman possess? I do not have the answer to that question, said Castellor. The Lord Commander- Lord Commander! interrupted Logan. 
He flaunts the title he stole from Rogal Dorn. This is an excellent point of finely aged cringe. Logan Grimnar, lacking any poise, interrupts Castellor to throw shade at Gilliman. Now whether his claim is right or wrong, justified or not, it's just so petty. It's weak argumentation. It's the kind of argumentation people who don't have any arguments make. Grimnar is starting to look like the kind of guy who would interrupt Castellor if he misspoke to point out this error to his pals. The discussion continues on, and Ulrich asks how many Primaris Space Wolves are active in Fleet Primus, and Castellor explains 3 to 4,000, that there are approximately two companies in the Torchbearer fleet. The wolves then deliberate for a bit, reassessing the dire state of their chapter strength, which Castellor overhears and extends an olive branch. To which Ariak must assert his dominance while self-reporting the frailty of his ego. This kind of ebb and flow continues for the duration of the meeting. Lieutenant Castellor acts as the ideal diplomat, and at every opportunity a Space Wolf's character replies in bad faith, resulting in Castellor having to explain the reasonable justifications to their prods. Three thousand. Did Gilliman rip up his rulebook? What happened to chapters of a thousand space marines? The situation, the predicament of the Imperium, requires new thinking. New chapters have been founded to replace losses over the last 10,000 years, and more will come. But for the immediate future, necessity overrules hierarchy. They will be your warriors, Lord Grimnar. And I need to come to Gilliman for more when they are dead. And Castellor explains he's already sent the data outlining they will have the means to create their own Primaris warriors, exposing a communication failure between Ulrich and Grimnar in the process. Logan then asks if there is a cost for what they are getting. Castellor explains that there isn't a cost, but there are regulations. That they coordinate with the Indomitus Crusade and plans which Gilliman has orchestrated. So, we have to answer to Gilliman. At last, he gets to command the wolves of Fenris, ten millennia after his first attempt. So then Castellor must explain. All chapters retain their autonomy. But it would be anarchy if we set loose tens of thousands of space marines without some strategy to guide their deployment. To which Logan responds. So, Gilliman doesn't trust me. You get the idea. The Space Wolves can't help but levy bad faith assumptions while lacking any poise. You know, poise counts. With the Great Wolf in particular delivering lines in a manner that you would imagine a youth would say to impress upon his friends. As you go through the book, there are more nuggets of great cringe. Logan Grimnar wants to demote Krom Dragon Gaze because he's the seat of Logan's perceived problems. During a council with all the wolf lords, they exhibit poor behavior, with even the oldest and wisest Bjorn the Fell Handed displaying a neurotic perception of Gilliman. Gilliman becomes required to put this issue to rest and so schedules a visit to Fenris. He writes a letter to Logan to request an audience. This causes Logan much frustration. When Gilliman arrives, the characters of import on both sides greet in the manner you would expect. But Logan Grimnar chooses to arrive late as he wants the Primarch to be waiting on him, and not vice versa. And when he does enter, boy does he make a show of it. The assembled companies knew well what to do, their bellowed responses short but intense. Logan Grimnar, bloody-handed warrior! Skjol! He piles the skulls of his enemies! Skjol! He builds a mound of the fallen! Skjol! His foes weep rivers of woe! Skjol! Logan Grimnar, the strong wolf of the pack! Then when he has no valid counter-arguments to make to Gilliman's points, he doesn't rationalize or reevaluate or continue with the diplomatic discourse. He just gets up and leaves, giving the act no acknowledgement, only stating that food is coming. It's a crying shame that the Space Wolves are portrayed in such a fragile, insecure manner. Especially when it's your commander-in-chief, Big Wig Chaptermaster. So after exploring some of the material, I'm sure you too find it to be cringeworthy. But you might be wondering why this is the case. What is it all for? Or rather, what does it serve in the plot? The answer is what the story is trying to do with Logan Grimnar. Here are the beats. The idea that he believes they are on the precipice of the Wolf Time, a worldview that runs counter to accepting the Primaris reinforcements. 
It's a weak rationale for Logan to not want Primaris, where he actively avoids information that would counter his own bias. After meeting with Castellor, Ulrich and Njal both hold the idea that it would behoove them to accept the Primaris reinforcements. And later, Njal and Aryak discuss that Logan hasn't been the same since they retreated from the Orc Space Hulk, explicitly showing that members of his council believe his judgement to be askew. Then we have Gilliman spelling out the reality of the situation making reasonable, fair, and provably true claims regarding the necessity of the Space Wolves accepting the Primaris reinforcements and tech. Then after all the sound logical reasons have been stated, Logan convinces his council to reject the Primaris by spouting the same unsubstantiated rationale. He just mentions the wolf time and it sways them. And it works, even though every time previously, it didn't. Then we time skip and Logan and company are feeling real good. Njal perceives Logan to be lighter, not carrying the grievances we saw earlier. And then Logan says this. True. There are a lot of battles ahead before we reach the wolf time. What? And then nine pages later, we see the Space Wolves have accepted the Primaris reinforcements. Were there some rewrites? I missed. We've skipped the meat of the arc. The point where we see a choice being made and what is informing it. Why did Grimnar change his mind? Well, it's anyone's guess. All the book tells us is that Grimnar accepted them under his own terms. What we have here is a loose idea of a character arc. But none of it's substantiated. It's essentially unconnected, and we don't even get to see what causes the growth or change of heart in Logan Grimnar. It reminds me of another story with an equally satisfying character arc, where a character has a crisis of confidence, and then the next time we see him, he's solved the problem and is better for it. The second major vector for cringe I would like to draw attention to is the idea that the Primaris reinforcements will threaten the Space Wolves culture. This is a topic raised at multiple points in the book. Grimnar brings it up in the meeting with Castellor. While training, another Space Marine tells it to Gaius. And in Chapter 16, Uller tells it to Gaius. He just can't be of Fenris. He's not from here. It's just the way it is. At around the halfway point of the book, Gaius becomes fed up with the lack of respect and acceptance. And, in an effort to prove there is no Fenrisian magic gained from being raised upon Fenris, he ejects himself out of a Thunderhawk onto a forest in the Outer Wilds. And over the rest of the book, we follow Gaius' journey back to the Space Wolf's base. He travels the land, survives Hellwinter, nearly dying, fights a big wolf and nearly dies, meets up with some locals, sails across the sea, fights a kraken and nearly dies again, and near the book's end, he returns to the Et. And would you believe it, everyone is just so impressed. So impressed that Uller too has had a change of heart. All of Gaius' grievances are forgiven, and he's now considered to be reborn as a true Fenrisian. He even gets a cool new Space Wolf's name to replace his old one. Now, while the story treats this as a triumphant achievement, I can't help but stare in confusion. How is it possible for the Space Wolves to vehemently stand by the notion that their cultural identity is defined by and can only be attained by growing up on Fenris, to the point where Logan Grimnar suggests they should reject the Primaris reinforcements as it would dilute their culture, and to the point where the collective consensus is that anyone not raised on Fenris can never be a true Fenrisian Space Wolf? But oh my god, if a Primaris Marine spends a few months on Fenris living as the locals do, it now proves they are Fenrisian. What a novel concept. Cultural integration. My goodness, what an idea. Why didn't I think of that? It's almost as though if you can integrate the Primaris to your culture, it isn't a problem at all. The story would have us believe that in the 10,000 plus years the Space Wolves have been operating, this line of logic has never entered the minds of any Fenrisian, so that this payoff can be a triumphant moment that shatters the rules of everything they thought possible. It's honestly baffling that the Space Wolves cannot connect these points as a possibility. Further still, to worsen the leaps in logic, we have a weak foundation for the payoff. The stakes are that the Fenrisian raised Space Wolves fear that taking in Primaris reinforcements, many times their number, would dilute and potentially see them lose their culture. A fair concern, it is an issue tied to immigration in the real world. The difference here 
is that we are not ever shown this to be a present threat. In fact, we are shown the opposite. Gaius's group actively tells us so, as they are all gung-ho 100% all-in for the cultural integration with the Fenrisian Space Wolves. Or simply, we aren't given any Primaris Space Wolf perspectives showing that they dislike, or at the very least, are indifferent to the current culture. So we, the audience, know the Primaris won't culturally clash. Which results in Logan Grimnar and the rest of the Fenrisian raised Space Wolves looking incompetent, due to their inability to perceive something made so explicitly clear. The Seed of Cringe So why do we have a story where the Space Wolves further lean into their negative associations, and one which has Grimnar go on an arc that we don't get to see? Well, I believe the answer is twofold. The first component is another, Primaris Problem. Oh yes, funny how we find ourselves here yet again. Now, I've made a video in the past about the plethora of problems the introduction of Primaris created, that it essentially just worsens the position of the Loyalist Marines as underdogs, that it debilitates the power fantasy element of entire armies players have bought, built, and painted, and that it would have all been better if it was just a new armor mark at a truer scale. But GW made their bed, and with the Dawn of Fire series, they have committed to it rather than using it as an opportunity to retcon. Which is a choice. But that isn't the inherent problem here. Rather, the problem here is the fallout created by the Primaris introduction. And it's a problem you can spot with many of the edgier chapters. Which is, the writer's desire to have them reject the Primaris because of their bad boy attitude. Which tracks well enough. But often, these chapters are in a weakened state, desperate for aid, in such a severe position that to not accept the Primaris would mean their end. The writing's on the wall as to why this is the case, as it puts those chapters in a position where they must accept them. This, however, becomes awkward as hell when those bad boy chapters try to justify their idiotic positions. Gabriel Seth wants his flesh terrors to be flawed, so he doesn't like Primaris. The Black Templars in Dawn of Fire Book 4 don't want to accept Primaris because if the Emperor wanted them to have Primaris, they would already have them. And in The Wolf Time, the Space Wolves don't want to accept Primaris because Logan Grimnar thinks that if he can send his chapter to its death, his Primarch will return. Until he changes his mind. Again, it's like poetry, so if they rhyme. The second component as to why this book features peak cringe is because of Gav's direction. Now I'll put out my usual disclaimer. No ill will to Gav here, but it seems to me Gav is perfectly happy to blindly lean into the associated tropes of various factions, for better or for worse. It creates circular logic. The Dark Angels have a reputation of being paranoid about their secrets, often making bonkers decisions because of it. So I will write a story where they act bonkers because of their paranoia. And so the snake continues to eat itself, and it perpetuates transhuman characters that lack poise. Now if I told you once, I've told you a thousand times, poise counts! Now that kind of logic loop isn't always going to be problematic, but it does become an issue when used to poorly justify actions or force your way to certain plot points. But I have good news. There is a better way. And while I don't want this to turn into how to write space marines, I'm going to share my point of view on the subject. The short of it is, I abhor when space marines fail to act transhumanly. And while it is true the transhuman lack of emotion does exist on a spectrum, when space marines fail to see reason and can't rationalize basic cause and effect to make prudent choices, it breaks any sense of immersion I can hold for a military organization that is supposed to be managed by beings which have transcended humanity. It creates incongruencies in the world. A mainstream example of this in effect is the nation of Wakanda, a nation that is supremely advanced with nanotech bulletproof suits, and balls that can heal spinal injuries, but whose leaders are chosen through trial by combat. But like I said, there is a solution to preserve flavor while keeping the believability intact. It just takes a little reframing and a bit of effort. I'll share an example. If the character sheet of the Space Wolves lists one of their defining qualities to be that they do not play well within the Imperium, it doesn't mean we need to write them so they come off looking irrational and incompetent when they are the protagonists of the book. Instead, why not write the Space Wolves so they still come across as brash and difficult to work with, but have a justification in place that merits it due to us readers having an insight to their perspective? Take the meeting with Castellor. 
The Space Wolves can act as they do in the book, whereby Castellor can see firsthand how uncooperative the Space Wolves are. But if we reframe Logan's motive to wanting to verify Castellor's honesty, principles, and general character through seeing how he reacts in their interaction, we have changed the framing so now the Space Wolves aren't lacking poise. They are just perceived as lacking it from Castellor's point of view, and the Space Wolves don't come across as brash or imprudent to us. Now the Space Wolves have justifiable reason to act in accordance with the desired quality of their character sheet. Which for me, is much more preferred than them demonstrating poor character due to their paranoia, desperation, and insecurity. What's in a name? Yes, it is true. I dislike the name of this book as well. It's just so clickbaity. And yes, while the story sees Grimnar desperate to believe it is the wolf time, to name a book after the keyword which is associated with the return of a Primarch is inarguably a key jangly thing to do. Especially so when Logan Grimnar's arc is, Nyal had a vision. This might be the wolf time. Two, if Gilliman has returned, Russ will too. Surely this is the wolf time. Two, never mind the truths Gilliman laid out, we don't need Primaris, it's the wolf time, let's go! Two, you know what? We're pretty far away from the wolf time. And then when deciding what to title this story, someone was like, I've got it! Let's call it the wolf time! How about... no? I mean, come the fuck on. What a tease. Way to toy with the emotions of Space Wolves fans. They'll see the title, say holy shit, buy the book, read it, and then say LIAR! You have to be aware you are naming your book after an event which doesn't take place within the confines of the story. It would be like calling your movie Infinity War only to have the Avengers deliberate on how many stones they do or do not have. You know what? I have the distinct impression of being in the presence of a a flim-flam artist. So, to those out there who want to know if The Wolf Time is worth a read, I'll leave you with this. Don't look, my sweet darling. It's too dangerous. Well, that's it for this one, and hopefully you can see why I find The Wolf Time to be cringe time. Thanks for watching, and a special thanks to my patrons, Julius Maximus, as well as the others who help keep the dream alive. Anyways, there are buttons for liking, sharing, and subscribing. So press the buttons you want to press, and I'll catch you in the next one.